Hello everyone, today we talk about Armenian warfare between the 11th and the 14th century for our regional warfare series, a very short introduction, I eliminated that actually from and from the other you know videos uh, series except for this one, because this is, especially for a channel based on medieval warfare, specifically of course just a very broad introduction, but of a very relevant region that also changed its actual geography um, over the years politically um, in, in at this time and encompassing thus actually other regions overlapping as we've seen especially in this um, you know Caucasian and uh, Levantine context where things were sort of more blended than than in other um, areas that we have analyzed with in fact other military cultures that we have Encompassed, uh, you have seen and made the, the video about the 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 Syrian, the Jazeera, and the Iraqi warfare. We talked about the Georgians already. Actually, I talked about the Byzantines recently. So I think this is fascinating. I also made recently a video about Armenian infantrymen. So we provided some some background there um, already. So let's just talk about this. Uh, in general, then let's pass in the end to the actual archaeological iconographic evidence that serves to support further uh, our point. Right, so we're talking about uh, definitely a region with a very ancient military uh, tradition. Uh, we have seen it actually not much for I didn't make so many videos about, say, the Hellenistic era or late antiquity, etc., about Armenian warfare in particular, but we have to. Uh, in the future. In any case, um, this is a fascinating frontier between a bit the, the, the step, the, the the between civilization and the the, the big civilization. Um, an area that is shaded from the within, as you will see now, and that, however, remained, um, let's say, uh, characterized by a quite distinctive warfare, especially in terms of social segmentation. This blend between uh, say the, the stamp military and some sort of feudal sanitary one locally and a continual perpetual infighting from the same within as well that naturally defined the Armenian armies and the elites that um, ruled them. So when we look at the high middle ages entering say from, from the 10th century especially into our period we see quite roughly Armenia divided in two parts Right, the first one was essentially the original uh, native land in the northeast uh, of Anatolia um, and the Caucasus. Right, and this was itself divided into a northeastern area ruled by the Bagratid dynasty and a southwestern one, uh, the Artsruni, um, that. Uh, had also a number of Arab Armenian emirates north of the Lake Van, characterized by uh, a number of Arab Armenian emirates north of the Lake Van. The division between the Bagratid um, and the Arsuni areas had uh, established itself between, uh, during the 9th century, say. Um, by the time it was sort of complete, the Bagratids were more Byzantine influenced historically. They were sort of the more developed area, the more powerful one. The Arsruni um, region was instead uh, more influenced by the Arabs. Uh, it was sort of a poor land to, to some extent, still sedentary, but also more pastoral uh, in nature. And there was essentially a conflict uh, throughout these centuries continuously um, between the, uh, the the Roman Empire and the Caliphate through these Armenian proxies that were quite mixed in terms of allegiance and that were in fact particularly capable of exploiting their decentralized position between the two uh, universal empires uh, in order to, to profit um, being supported by this uh, or the other. Um, so these were autonomous areas that had not really ever undergone uh, a significant statalization. The, here we are in the Mashrek, uh, they are mountainous areas. Um, civilization existed, as we've seen from millennia, but it had failed essentially to centralize 
and uh, this is especially evident during the the early Middle Ages, and in the High One, there is a sort of feudal, further feudalization that more or less uh, is happening all around as well. So with the actually further definition of, of private armies and uh, say feudal um, uh, decentralized powers, um, in spite of the re-expansion of, of these lordships of, of a um, of a truly regional dimension of the dynasties that were ruling on them. Um, needless to say, the Byzantines and the Arabs had heavily influenced the local warfare, right? The Armenian principalities remained under either Byzantine or, or Islamic suzerainty, which meant that these um, powers would uh, not just supply uh, support and back uh, the Armenian uh, nobility there, but would also require from them as subjects military service, thus, uh, as we will see now, bringing the, the Armenians abroad, right, with very important uh, uh, numbers and, but, and also political and military capacity. At some point, they, they dominated as mercenaries Fatimid Egypt. I made a video about the uh, Fatimid army, but we will come back on it. This subjection also brought to further expansion, especially of Byzantine power towards the east. Um, in the late 10th and early 11th century, we also observed it in videos about uh, manualistic Byzantine history. Yes, this was a decentralized frontier, wouldn't really change uh, that much in that regard. The major fortifications were um, in, in settlements more and, and military colonies to, to an extent were the type from which the, the tagmata uh, units were were recruited were far west inland in, into Anatolia. Um, Armenia had a number of again of a very important strategic uh, centers, but the problem was controlling them. And again, the same Armenian legions was uh, often floating. Right. In any case, um, among the last independent rulers of Armenia before the Byzantines in this era um, took over was a half Arab and half Armenian dynasty known as the Kaizik by the Armenians and uh, Yahafit by uh, the Arabs, right, by the Muslims. Um, there would be a more, a greater autonomy, much greater autonomy and de facto independence by the other area of Armenia would emerge historically later. That is the one of Chilicia, right, and part of the Taurus Mountains chain. Quite strategic location, by the way, that would allow these Armenians to, in fact, resist with a greater um, uh, effectiveness as well uh, to the um, to the Islamic uh, onslaught. Uh, of course, to with with the proper con international contextualization, because there were the Crusaders from one side, the Byzantines from the other, uh, but not always in, in friend on friendly terms uh, as well. And notoriously, um, Chilicia and the Taurus Mountains would be colonized by the Armenians fleeing from the Caucasus due to uh, especially Islamic pressure, but also. Um, Byzantine resettlement of the local population in, in that area. Uh, it was in part also a, a spontaneous phenomenon um, and it did bring to some important power being consolidated on, on the Mediterranean. The Principality of Armenia and Cilicia, in fact, is one of the most important uh, in, the, in the Crusades theater, right? And we have already looked at their cavalry, for example, or their general warfare actually doing within that Levantine context. We do not have exact measures of the population quantity distributed respectively um, in the Caucasus and uh, in Cilicia. Uh, there is a major historiographical debate uh, regarding to this for reasons also that are somehow I'd say external to history. Like, of course, they have a political meaning to some sort. Um, as far as we are concerned here, it doesn't matter um, so much as 
uh, appreciating the, the the relevance, in fact, of Armenian warfare uh, in in the area, right? Uh, and the fact that a Christian Armenian culture is dominant for a long time in the region, which also allows us to sort of track even the, for example, the think about manuscript sources, right? Uh, the script is different, the styles are different, the just the topics are different, right? You have this beautifully illuminated Bibles that in themselves they sort of contain this Armenian traditional uh, iconography that is influenced, as we will see, by in fact all the, the surrounding peoples, but that remains somehow distinctive and helps us visualizing uh, from through this guy's filter that is always relevant, this weapon or armor uh, and how and why they would, they would represent it in, in that peculiar way, right? We see, of course, an important mix of this population with, uh, for example, the Islamic one in many Armenian cities, there were, of course, uh, Muslims. Um, the fascists of the Armenian politics and society was incarnated by the Nacharaks, right? These were essentially some kinglets, right? If you want the word the nobility of Armenia, uh, each of these guys had some military obligations to one another, the higher ones, the, the overlords, but we cannot equate it fully to a feudal system. I mean, in many ways, it is um, the same to, to a degree that, however, is more resemblant of the Byzantine pranoia or the uh, Islamic ictus. But it is also very, very Armenian in, in its own regard and reflecting especially, I wouldn't say an anarchic you know, character of these Armenian nobility, but, but the nobility that was aware of its... Uh, prerogatives and that in fact took also this quite large initiative in their settlements, in their political allegiance in the way they would um, join a common to, to the, common, in the common cause at some point as well. We do not see a, a directly tied um, you know military obligation to their land holding right? That would have occurred just in a more, at a more metaphysical level in their um, spiritual uh, view, uh, their land was theirs and there wasn't too much you could do to dislodge them from there, right? And especially in the Caucasus, this had been true for millennia, as we, as we were pointing out. Many valleys, many castles, very tough ground, lots of height difference. And as we have already observed in that video about the Armenian infantry, and there's a lot of siege warfare and uh, that, that, that witnesses the the, the enormous resources necessary to even just dislodge uh, you know, a lord from uh, a single lord from his uh, domains, right? Then you have essentially the the broader aristocracy that would form the the actual numerical backbone of the Armenian armies, the Azat, um, a warrior class essentially that in this case did clearly owe military service to uh, Nacherarch in return for their land, right? This would, of course, be blurred at some point, depending on how the powerful they would get, it's so similar to the, to the higher uh, nobility. Uh, but they still embodied a privileged class, right? A, a feudal establishment that was firmly separated from the rest of the population. In fact, this is what hap had happened in, uh, in Armenia. The majority of the population was, of course, working to support this, say, quasi-feudal system. And in practice, they would be uh, just demilitarized serfs, right? Everything was functional. Uh, in this, you do find infantry mobilized, peasants that surely knew how to, you know, cut throats in, in moments of need, also because of the the objective brutality, aside from the, the, the native Armenian warfare, like, was, was 
rendered necessary by the constant waves of peoples um, from the steps that had hit Armenia. Think about the Turks, uh, but the, in general, but how this had blended with the same Byzantine and Islamic policy regarding Armenia. So the, the militarized serfs, but backing up robust uh, militarized uh, elite. This is a bit the, the characteristic of Armenia. As we will see also in the iconography, etc., this world is, of course, lighter uh, on average than the one of Western Europe. So th there is a great similarity, again, especially with the Byzantines, with um, even with, with the Turks. Actually, Armenia, as we will see now, belongs to a sort of much more sort of Iranian-influenced uh, dimension, Persified Turkic one um, in terms of fighting styles, right? Uh, that is definitely, in fact, conferring that uniqueness uh, in an otherwise, but very, especially very Byzantine influence in only parts of Mesopotamian um, influence uh, reality. Because Persia had been culturally dominant in the air, it would keep being so, and during during the the Abbasid Caliphate. Um, so it's fair to say that the military tradition of Armenia laid um, very close to that of Western Iran, right? I made a video about that region as well. So if you're interested, you can check that out. A couple of years ago, um, then you have. Again, in, in order of importance, Constantinople and the Arab-dominated uh, areas, right? As you can expect, the Armenian military elite was, at this point, made up of heavily armored cavalrymen. You do find uh, partially metal-armored horses. Apparently, because Armenia was rich in iron, so the story goes that ah, oh, look, the Armenians were plenty of actually of this. This is, doesn't um, doesn't actually correspond to immediately to reality because it's not just about the availability of, of metal that allows you to simply extract it, work it. So that costs a lot, right? Apparently, the Armenian had very good smiths, etc., but they did not have an abnormally large amount of heavily armored troops, right? Um, they stood out as far as their elite, of course, was concerned. They had good arms and armor, but this wouldn't make um, a significant or traceable difference in terms of their military effectiveness in general. I mean, von Clausewitz, war is primarily about moral forces, of course. And the Armenians did have those, and that's the, the interesting aspect of it. In fact, there were also more likely equipped troops that were appreciated in their capacity. It seems that the sort of typical uh, equipment for these Armenian aristocrats was a large shield, spear, spears, plural, and sword, including single-edged sabers, which, again, we, we've seen in the videos about Eurasian steppe warfare, especially also about Armenia, how these were there, right? It would have not been so particularly typical to Armenia. They were obviously a, mostly a, a Turkic, um, you know, in, in Turkic injected um, type uh, of blade, right? But that's also not particularly changing the game, right? Of of fencing, of 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 combat uh, effectiveness. Just that there, there are important um, cultural influences in in a broader sense. Um, interestingly enough, the Armenians uh, from actually from from millennia had had a a horse archery tradition that, however, was slightly different from the one of the steps because, differently from the Turks, that, as we've seen in many videos and crusade battles, one, for example, um, tended to have this 
basically throw away horse archer and then this very ultra narrow as um you know numerically as highly qualitative um elite right to that often was not even enough to actually crush the enemy adequately softened up by arrow fire for good look even at manzikert for example um did not fight dispersing right uh, themselves the armenians seem to have backed closely uh, their heavily armored horsemen with horse archers that acted in tandem in, in a more closely packed fashion than what the turks really did right and it was sort of clumsier in a broader sense because they had really lost of these horse archers it was not even it wouldn't make a sense even to, just to to calculate to match their their order uh, in certain uh, military circumstances uh, by the way the armenian knights would know how to use their uh, their bow and horseback as pretty much uh, every single knight that existed at, at the time everywhere except of course that the armenians wouldn't develop in the same way that the shock the um, um, charge of the thickly packed um, you know uh, formations like, at least to the degree that the westerners were developing in their feudal warfare uh, there is also less cohesion likely so a greater reliance even on individual capacity which would entail some reminiscence again from also this Sasanian party and influence passed to, to some extent of being able to use both the sword and the bow in, in, as a single man at arm which is something you find in fact uh, in the also in, in the Persian uh, area continuing uh, during the the Middle Ages, to of course not a, a structural systemic fashion like it happened only truly in in our Sassid times, uh, but still because of the aforementioned reasons, right? Um, Armenians were also considered good at siege warfare. At least their military engineers were apparently quite ingenious. They had uh, various ways to especially protect themselves from the enemy uh, from the from the, the, the fortresses defenders also to to climb them and uh, the Byzantines would uh, use um, some of these guys the same the same Crusaders um, noticed this um, and this is a testament again to their mountain warfare especially their uh, the, the siege uh, uh, circumstances this incredibly tough like isolated rocks at the top of mountains that they had to, to to be able to storm in their habitual warfare in their native land um, Armenia also poured soldiers out of itself uh, during the centuries for different reasons when we look at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, we are brought to say, well, okay, the, essentially the Seljuks broke the dam, they swarmed in Anatolia, and that's basically it, right? And before that, everything was just fine. This is not really correct. The, the Byzantine frontier was very permeable from quite a while, and there were lots of peoples that um, not just joined the Seljuks, in uh, entering Anatolia from places as far as the Rus, uh, and in fact among the the, the, the Armenians, the Kurds, um, but that had already been doing so from quite a while. And the Byzantines, from one side, had been countering them, to, had exploited the phenomenon to settle some of these guys as local subjects, it also their lords, right, and the, with the retinues as military colonists and so on. However, the situation had been degrading from a while, and this had, of course, entailed an important degree of warfare, right? The same Armenians would settle, of course, in, in these better uh, pastors in the West uh, and would uh, stand their ground, right, and having this, uh, again, typical frontier warfare with raids, you know, those still an encastellated landscape and still threats coming from further east right that everyone had to cope with 
uh, at a point. So that's the sort of ambiguous relation existing between the Byzantines and the Armenians. Uh, as far as those Armenians who remained instead in, in the Caucasus, in spite of what was formerly um, sort of a distance protection that the Empire offered them, that however led to direct occupation in this, you know, the, just before, like in the second half of the 11th century, at its greatest uh, extent, um, they had been providing, of course, largely, in fact, for their own defense from any kind of invader, right? Uh, especially in the 50s um, of the 11th century, you can observe how the the the, the Armenian nobility is stepping up their with their um, sort of military entrepreneurship and also further fortification that the empire was evidently not able to provide them aside from again these garrisons that would also come to rule on various parts of the same Armenia and um, not necessarily and or and or simply defending it. After Manzikert, however, these relations had developed, the system uh, collapsed, like the Byzantine umbrella basically disappeared. And in, in this sense, what you see from the 50s is, was just the, the Armenian awareness that things could sort of, uh, you know, go wrong in a way or another. Um, we will see now what 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 also in part had been going on with mercenaries of different ethnicities. There were the Normans around, right? Uh, the Byzantines were had been using um, uh, mercenaries from Western Europe for quite a while, and, and these guys were just continuing in part what even some Viking had been doing in, Cauc in the Caucasus uh, at some point without too much pleasure of, of the local uh, inhabitants. Um, uh, in any case, uh, the local Armenian lords uh, had no choice but protecting their own territory and people as best they could. This brought to a crisis, as we've seen also in Exodus in part, but also to a further fortification and feudalization, because the system was shattered and private powers increased even more. So, not really um, a positive phase. The Turks uh, swarmed through the Caucasus into central Anatolia. With them, again, there were other peoples as well. Uh, in any case, the, the Turkoman nomads were not really recommendable individuals. I mean, the heavily persified uh, Seljuks had, of course, um, embodied some standard of higher um, sophistication in terms of so political and um, governmental practice, not more than much, telling you the truth, but especially they would uh, fuel their their armies with these. The, how it had really been normal up to that point, with enormous amounts of people that technically had nothing to do with them, coming from as far as Central Asia, um, that just knew that now a great lord like in Persia and however they 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 thought of it or call it like had broken through, finally, uh, the great lands of the room that were, were equaling, even in the steppes, and now they, they, they could simply just come and settle, right? And it was pretty messed up. And uh, this invested Armenia um, to, to the degree uh, that we've seen, like, the migration um, southwards uh, uh, and westwards from Cappadocia into the Taurus Mountains, Right, that are, as you know, quite mountainous areas. Made a video about the Roman province of Cappadocia back in the day, and I mean the terrain for armies of that time, of course, was pretty much similar to one of antiquity. The Taurus Mountains being, in fact, the the gateway to uh, Anatolia and Syria, respectively. Um, so, holding an enormous significance, even just in the history of Byzantine strategy, as far as their control uh, of the Levant. Right, the idea of the reconquest of Jerusalem um, and more was concerned. Um, so the Armenian Caucasus degraded itself, it, it declined in importance as well. Um, historically, it would be taken over by other powers, as we will see in the later Middle Ages. Um, 
what we appreciate is the new centers of Armenian power springing up in the Taurus and uh, further beyond, uh, as far as the northern Jazeera. Cities like Edessa, that is today's Urfa and Antioch, today's Antakya, um, were actually the, the most important these centers, so literally the, the most important centers of, of the region as well. This tells you the degree that after all the, Ar the Armenians had, even just as a sort of um, refugee people at this point, uh, in seizing these areas. In, in other words, invading uh, and controlling other areas uh, that were also fairly advanced, just in the moment in which you have to move from, from your own land. Uh, somewhere else. There are interesting parallels with Khorasm, as we will see now. There are also some witness connections between the Armenian panoply and the one of, of Transoxiana um, at some point. There is a very interesting uh, Armenian commander at this point, Philaretus, uh, very, you know, uh, Hellenized um, name that, of course, had uh, imperial connections as he commanded, in fact, a large amount of what was at the time the Byzantine southeastern Anatolian frontier. Right, uh, this guy essentially exploited his uh, his situation to autonomize himself, to aggrandize his own power between the Byzantines and the Turks. In order to succeed in this, he allied himself with different um, Arab uh, princes, neighboring um, his controlled area. Uh, so exploiting the sort of ethnic thing, considered that at this point the, the Seljuks had sort of just arrived in, in, Le in the Levant, so th it was the first wave. Um, there were in many ways um, zealous fanatics, to say the least, not even the Arabs in this like them as newly converted Muslims and and of course were an incredibly primitive and and brutal people in many ways um, and uh, but this made good made them good good troops uh, as well to exploit um, Philaretus army was uh, made up of of course Armenian troops cavalry infantry as, as we've seen but also uh, Western European mercenaries, mostly Norman, for the synecdoche that it means, uh, and mostly troops in the sense, in fact, that had been formerly in Byzantine military service. Right? We see an increasing amount of Western Europeans being hired at this point uh, by the Byzantines, uh, and that would literally settle in the area, and lords like Philaretus was power, were powerful enough to be able to hire them, to give them land to settle and to defend also from these waves. So this is interesting as far as the Crusades also are concerned, because throughout all their development, this was this Cilician Armenian principality that also hosted lots of, of Franks, right? And it made uh, made it clear in that video about um, factually and Armenian warfare, but also in those videos about, for example, the Norman, say, actually Frankish and, and Byzantine mercenaries within the same Seljuk armies in Anatolia after massacred uh, for, for also the following centuries, right? The degree of Western mercenaries settlement throughout all the, the Near East is probably one of the most overlooked topics for high and late medieval uh, history, I would say, not just warfare. Um, Philaretus was, however, fi and finally defeated by the Turks uh, after a few years of this uh, experiment, right, and in spite of the good troops that he actually owned, so the, the Seljuks, after all, were were the, the newcomers, the, the fresh uh, blood and riches thirsty um, guys that would take over the sea, right? Eventually, of course, collapsing immediately. I mean, as, as soon as the Seljuk Sultanate was established, it fragmented, but in, in, in a feudal fashion. Still, however, the Turks had been taken over, essentially, 
um, Arab warfare broadly meant from, from and Persian one as well from quite a while. So as a consequence, what you see is so-called again principality of Armenian Cilicia, uh, smaller lordships, right? That were also allowed to survive by the same Seljuks that, after all, cared only to get rid of major policies and they were okay with this fragmented situation among their subjects. Um, in fact, the Armenians would be used by the Turks in their quite subtle uh, and uh, large-scale struggle uh, with the Arab Amirs of the Euphrates and northern Syria that were also... powers had been complacent with the Byzantines and uh, partly also in contact with the Armenians, with the Kurds historically, to remain a bit more decentralized from the bigger centers of power in um, in the in fact in the in Mesopotamia from mostly the Caliphate that now had been hijacked fundamentally by by the Seljuks. In fact, that that is the point. Um, Urfa, Edessa was one of these highly militarized city states. Right, it displayed as we've seen in those videos also about Syrian warfare of an important permanent Armenian garrison and local Syrian militia. When the, you know, this was taken over by the Crusaders in the first, in the, in the first expedition. Uh, and so, yes, they, the Franks came to rule over uh, 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 a, a, such an important city in the area had been controlled by, de facto, by the Armenians, even though as sort of um, Seljuk more or less subjects, uh, and that had this this to get a bit like within the the wake of the Syrian military tradition, an important urban uh, militia, in fact, that witnesses important organization, also fortification. Um, a city like Antioch, Antakya, had at some point directly been directly controlled by the Seljuks. This is too much an important of a city, also symbolically, because it was just a, basically a giant middle finger to the Byzantines that considered this, in fact, as uh, it, w it was one of the, the great patriarchies of of um, of the empire, and uh, this uh, was, of course, just also a symbolic um, victory. Antioch naturally was located too far west and especially too close to these other Christian powers to be maintained by the Turks. Uh, so actually when the Crusaders take over Antioch as well it would become the, the capital of the of the Hauteville Principality in, in the in the Near East. You you do find, however, some local military elites having that were Armenian also in in origin, but having acquired through cooptation and imitation, and again competition among one another to engrace the 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 rulers for major posts of power, some Turkified names, right? And uh, this tells you, however, how adaptable the Armenians were obliged to be in this mess. Uh, of a situation. I mean, there, there is a particularly fragment. You see, this is the difference with Europe. Europe is fundamentally homogeneous, ethnically speaking. You have the various nationalities, and that's basically it. Until you arrive to the steppe, you don't find this kind of strange um, uh, religious, cultural, racial blends, right? Um, in the in the Near East, like you can argue, till to this day, like the total political mess, like a continuous warfare, this, the sense that so many different populations, so that many different groups uh, alternated, reclaimed, like reassociated, sometimes made, completely made up at, at, to some extent, uh, and or at least weaponizing their own entities in ways that had nothing to do with the actual progressed uh, status, etc., had engulfed historically. This is not a point, no, there's absolutely nothing to refer to the current situation. Um, but it's like when, when you see, I make those um, historical regions series for Europe, it's just like all the basically all the same story, right? In, in a linear fashion, there is a crisis, whatever, but these things remain always the same. 
in the Muslim world, broadland is a freaking mess that never ends. And without forgetting that there are lots of Christians there that also managed to survive in spite of all the the difficulties during various historical years. And so the Armenians in many ways uh, today the, t today's video period are you know embodying these struggles as well. Um, so further northwest you had Chilicia proper, right? Uh, the Kingdom of Lesser Armenia, as it was called. This was the most sheltered part, the one that in fact would host the majority of Armenians that would have a greater political cohesion and continuity compared to these other territories that were just so further east. Um, it's um, it, it's a fairly wealthy place, just even located. You have Cyprus across the sea, you have some important trade routes crossing and uh, from Syria into Anatolia. You have especially this major strategic advantage of holding the Taurus Mountains passes uh, in the north, right? And especially during the, the Crusades, you know how relevant that was for for the Christian passage, for also the Byzantines to try actually to restore their suzerainty on these territories. There are endless political uh, changes, alignments uh, during those relatively few centuries that the Crusades lasted. Um, this is essentially still a Byzantine Islamic frontier, right? It would remain. It was before the arrival of the Crusaders and after the... Well, not really after the arrival of the Crusaders, but still uh, you do find, in fact, a Western presence there. Uh, the Byzantines are not that far away. And this area had been quite one of frontier from within the same Islamic world, right? Normally it was a place where sort of more violent sects... Um, uh, the condemned by orthodoxy uh, took refuge. Um, there is a lot of... Um, the, the, the environment is similar to the one of Armenia. Uh, after all, there was usually some um, some, uh, you know, taste by by these guys for, you know, the, the previous... also the landscape in, to some extent. Um, and in fact, the area was full of castles predictably enough. Uh, it had always been the case, again, since the, the Islamic um, Byzantine struggle. And this area is taken over by the Armenians essentially by the early 80s of the 11th century. Just after, you see, it took a decade after massacred for, for this to happen. right? And interestingly enough, in spite of some relative Byzantine complacence to, complacency to this, the local Greek population had been expelled as well. You have two main dynasties emerging. Uh, one that was opposed to Constantinople, the Europeans, uh, that were in the east of Cilicia, and the pro-Byzantines, the Etumians, to the west. Um, the former would be able to uh, conquer the latter in the by, by the, the 80s of the 12th century and managed in fact to go on surviving the same Ottoman states in Syria and Palestine. So this is quite relevant because um, they would manage to last until 1375, Lesser Armenia would be conquered by the Mamluks, and it sort of incarnated actually the, the last Christian outpost out there, right? Cut out essentially from the, the main contact with other Christian powers. Yes, there were the Crusaders technically still around, like the Crusades, and the Crusaders were, were not over uh, in, in the air, they would remain until the the rise of, of the Ottomans as a, as a broader power in the 15th century. They were quite close and supporting the Armenians. In fact, the Armenians were always asking for support uh, by the Westerners that were a bit lazy at the time uh, because of the general 14th century crisis, the, the, all the issues that they had objectively as well. So the lesser Armenian resistance 
to the Muslims is, is a testament to the tenacity of these people's um, uh, culture and military resistance uh, to the Islamic invader. Um, as you can imagine, uh, also Lesser Armenia made an important use of Western forces. Right, uh, the Christian powers in Europe did provide Armenia and Chilitia with a significant amount of political and military support, in, especially in the early days, because they were just next to them. Very often, the, the Armenians were hostile to Antioch, for example. Um, and again, the, the politics here are, is, is quite enormously complicated. We must make, I think I make the only one video about the Komnenian frontiers that talks about this area in some detail, so we will have to continue with that. Um, in any case, um, this support was not enough, simply, in itself to military restructure the, the country to have some sort of long-lasting impact in the first place. I mean, the, the same Crusader states were were pretty much uh, and chronically so um, short of manpower from Europe, so you can imagine how much they, they would care about the, the Armenians in proportion. Um, but it was an important card to play. This brought, uh, and not just just through the Frankish, but also through the, the Byzantine and even the same Islamic um, culture, a process of feudalization. This is particularly evident uh, in the latter part of the 12th century under King Leon II, the Great. Um, I think this is a very important indicator of how close at this point Armenian Chalitia actually was to to the West, broadly meant, because uh, this is the same phase in which, I don't know, Germany was, was fostering properly a, a Western Frankish feudalism. And in comparison, Armenia here was just being more broadly Western influence. But engineering that on purpose, Leon II properly encouraged this process of feudalization. This is what the, the Komnenoi were doing themselves in Constantinople at the time of Emmanuel um, and uh, so in fact here we are in the same years uh, and this did pass through the settlement of many Western mercenaries as we were saying right and what is even more striking is how successful the Armenians were in adopting this um, this feudalism especially compared to the Byzantine Empire overall right the Armenian military culture was also changing accordingly, right? Uh, uh, rulers like Leon II were essentially imitating not just the military, but obviously the political institutional models of powers like the Principality of Antioch, right? This changed a lot what ha was the sort of much more primitive and archaic Armenian uh, warfare coming from the Caucasus that as we will see later sort of did remain in, in was remaining in, in the meanwhile relatively unscathed by the, this this um, uh, reforms if you can call them like this um, and that would remain in fact quite uh, backwards in a sense e even later right or e and or influenced by different models such as the the Mongol ones and or still the the closer Persian one. Armenians were famous mercenaries to some extent. Um, most of them during this period served the Crusader states. Uh, we are not particularly informed about their origins, but it seems that these were coming from Chilicha mostly, or the Taurus, even the Jazira. They were both cavalrymen and infantrymen. They maintained a sort of feudal profile because they were after all settled uh, more or less in that fashion the Byzantines as we explained already in that video about the the infantrymen during more or less this period that was from the 6th to the 11th century so sort of overlaps in part the with the beginning of our period um, were really present in large numbers it seems 
that in the wake of that sort of gradual uh, decline on, on the eastern frontier, the Byzantine authorities uh, decided to disband as many as 50,000 Armenian militiamen, which doesn't mean that they were all employed at the same time, um, but they were essentially part of a local levy system that the Empire was saying, basically, well, this doesn't work anymore, let's uh, forget about that. Um, and uh, especially in a phase of advanced feudalization, also monetization, where, again, if you bought a, a Norman mercenary, you, you would have spent those money better proportionally to, to a bunch of Armenian militiamen. However, some Armenian troops, and especially those uh, to be found among the lords of Western Cilicia, are still recorded uh, during the Comnenian era in the 12th century as being quite, uh, say, effective, being present at least, and uh, part of the reason being that, as we've seen, they had received also more Western influence themselves. So they were more similar to um, to the Crusaders. Right. As we'll see now, again, Ar Armenian warfare was essentially lighter compared to, to the Western one, but it was increasingly similar to it during this period. Needless to say, many Armenians would serve also Islamic powers. For example, the same Sultanate of Rum in Turkish Anatolia, from the, the very beginning seemingly, and for the aforementioned reasons, that, that is, many Armenians had just flowed into Anatolia after uh, massacre had happened, and the Seljuks had truly incentivized that to some degree to get more manpower, more subjects in these areas that, by the way, they were not particularly good at holding, at least as much as the Byzantines had done. There was a process of desertification of Anatolia that the Byzantines had maintained irrigation systems, like a more developed agriculture, um, etc. Uh, the Armenians were rough um, mountaineers, so they weren't bothered by say, more uh, primitive living condition, to the point that many of them would be absorbed by the same Seljuk elite, right? This is um, an interesting process. There were some even Byzantine rulers that would be fostered in the Sultanate of Rome. Um, so, of course, this, these rulers were... Uh, augmenting their status, uh, whatever. The Armenians were being co-opted uh, in, in this process. They were seeking, after all, for um, improving their condition. We find a large number of Armenian troops in the Seljuk armies of Rome during the 13th century, a bit at the peak of uh, this, the latter's power. Um, however, uh, many Armenians, especially those who had remained in the Caucasus, kept fighting against the Seljuks or, or any other invader. Some joined forces with the Mongols, for example, against the same Seljuks, and others, of course, fought against the Mongols as well. We will see partly the influence that this left in the local warfare. All right. In any case, we find Armenian mercenaries in 12th century Islamic Syria uh, as infantry archers in the armies of Nur al-Din, one of other uh, smaller Muslim princes. We see also different internal divisions within the Armenians. In Damascus, in 1138, a group of Armenian horsemen um, is recorded belonging to a heretical sect known as the Arevoric that ancestrally still believed that Christ to be the Son. Right? I made a video about the, the Sol Invictus. This was part of it. There was a lot of sort of um, Zoroastrian, sort of Iranian influence there for sure. That this, this is typical of, again, especially areas like the Caucasus of also the, the regions on, on the Caspian Sea that had remained very sheltered in, in a sense and sort of 
from from other religious influences and had camp while converting to monotheism what we call also improperly monotheism as if there hadn't been anything different but this is another another story still kept much of those old ancestral uh, symbolism and this tells you also uh, again how primitive really the Armenian mindset was in the Caucasian era and how their warfare was uh, as well right uh, as we were re recalling before Fatimid Egypt at some point was dominated by Armenian mercenaries from the various uh, among the various nationalities that at some point had uh, a smaller and greater leverage on the local sultanian policy right so uh, you do have quite uh, some not really globe trotter but definitely someone who knew how to exploit job opportunities especially if you if those were the simple good old chopping people to pieces uh, for a living right um, so let's pass to, I mean, these aspects of, um, after all, the more, the, the more Eastern and sort of more typical uh, Armenian dimension. If you want also the least documented, uh, which is, however, balanced by the, still the large numbers and, of course, the permanence of Armenia uh, as a country in Armenia, culturally speaking, that was more exposed, as we've seen, to Eastern influences from the Turks to the Mongols. Um, we have famous relief carvings uh, on the exterior of King Gagik, uh, Gagik's church in the island of Akhtamar, in the lake, famous Lake Ban. Right? They date to the early 10th century, so a bit early for our period, but it's still relevant because of course things wouldn't change that much uh, even in the following immediately following period and we find a very interesting blend of cultural influences we find Saint Theodore for example wearing a scale or lamellar cuirass that is very similar to some that we have observed uh, in the video about Byzantine warfare the same period uh, Cappadocia there is an evil Goliath um, depicted in armor, which is l definitely Eastern looking. Right, you have a cuirass, probably with male tippet or raven tail, laminated band braces. These are extremely, actually identical. Right, uh, extremely similar, actually identical to early 8th century Transoxanian. Um, arms and armor as depicted on the wall paintings from Penjikant, right? I think these are preserved um, in St. Petersburg at the Hermitage uh, and uh, they show how close actually the the influence of Iran with, uh, and Eastern Islam way before the Seljuks came around. We can't trace most of these contacts, but there were war bands uh, going around across, uh, like around the Caspian, um, and really further, further beyond. The, the Vikings were around in the same centuries, so you can imagine all these encounters in in the midst of some place, the, uh, the the name of which has been, of course, forgotten, and that still made military culture, right? We find also great similarity regarding Goliath's sword to one weapon found in the early 11th century Islamic shipwreck from the from Sarsaliman, which is located in the province of Antalya on the Mediterranean. Um, this um, Sarsaliman is a small bay, right in, in southern Turkey, and you find here instead of, again, from the east we have the, the western extreme uh, to some extent. Um, also we have some hand armor, probably a coif, um, there is a, a bow uh, with different types of draw displayed, or at least the ones, methods of holding the bowstring in the right hand. We find 
thumb draw uh, normally associated with the Islamic horse archery in the 10th century. There is a hauberk, kind of male helmet, uh, and tufts on either side of the neck, which is very similar to the typically Turkic nomadic uh, long hairstyle, right? So it's not just that there would be guys again from from the steppes already around at that point, but likely some settlement there and adopting such customs himself. There is a great deal of Byzantine influence, uh, mostly through the aforementioned male cups. Yet there, there is um, a fascinating feature in the Armenian Gospel from the 11th century preserved at the San Lazaro Library uh, in Venice. This is manuscript number 141 uh, slash 102. And if you look at the folio 77 recto, displaying uh, an illumination of the guards at the tomb of Christ, you find some bamboo spear shaft that, uh, as you know, is connected with Arab warfare. We have another interesting illumination depicting the betrayal of, of Christ from an Armenian gospel. This is the manuscript 974 at the Matanadaran library in Yerevan, dating to the 11th century, displaying double-headed axes, very similar to the ones seen in the Cappadocians painted church. Uh, in fact, frescoes between the 10th and, and the 11th century. There is surely some light tabers in um, cavalry axe uh, influence in them that was used uh, by by the Muslims and especially like the, the Persian uh, troops uh, this time. Uh, the art is sometimes crude and, and or not particularly detailed, but it's fascinating to point out. We have from the, the carved stone reliefs from the tympanum of the monastery church of Sir Bertomeus, dating possibly between the, either the, the 12th or the 13th century. The chronology, however, is highly debated. Uh, and the place is not even that easily accessible because there is a Turkish army base uh, in in the in Loco. So um, this tympanum is from a ruined monastery uh, church, very close to the Iranian frontier east of Lake Van. You know, Turkey and Iran share some like uh, 500 kilometers of, of border, right? And the interesting aspect of this carving art is that is, it seems very similar to the older Sasanian Persian one, right? Even if, of course, that we're talking Christian Armenians here, again, the certain mo models, certain symbols that the great Persian Empire that had sort of re uh, tried to, to reestablish the Achaemenid one still echoed. Right in in the surroundings and in this landscapes that where will you think that the world that the time had stopped to some extent, as you were recalling before, even in in relation to other regions that were undergoing. Think about again Armenian Cilicia that was sort of much more updated, so by Western influence, right? Um, there are definitely some clothes in say dress characteristics that resemble those Sasanian ones. But an interesting aspect is a victorious horseman using stirrups and a defeated horse archer carrying a clearly angled form of composite bow, yeah, which actually would speak of a later date. We have an Armenian Psalter from the 11th to 12th century preserved at the library of the Vatopedio Monastery, Mount Athos, Greece, uh, manuscript 608, folio 283, 
see a very interesting biblical scene um, displaying like the guards uh, of the king of Nineveh uh, wearing pointed helmet, mail shirt, some sort of archaic splinted arm and waist defenses. These are very similar to the ones used uh, displayed in Byzantine art during the same period, right? However, we also see a flat bottom kite uh, shaped shield. This is to be found either in Islamic or Italian contexts for separated reasons. Um, and it is provided here to the evil king, which surely um, represents some sort of uh, Islamic prototype. In fact, the shield displays some pseudo Kufic inscription, so mimicking essentially the, the Muslim script, and uh, it surely refers to, to that Eastern cultural influence. We find, interestingly enough, a saber from the northern Ural Mountains, an Armenian saber, <laughs> um, dating to the 12th, 13th century. This is preserved at the uh, Archaeological Institute of the Academy of Sciences of St. Petersburg and how this saber arrived so close to the Arctic Ocean from Armenia is unknown, right? But we shouldn't be surprised, right? Through contacts with Volga, Bulgaria, through some, you know, um, uh, Finnic tribe um, further north. We have documented even part of those uh, regions uh, recently and uh, you know that everything is possible right it, it's by the way a beautiful weapon right slender was uh, slightly curved and beautifully inlaid it has sh uh, it has short straight key on a sleeve below the key on uh, which makes it uh, you know fitting tightly at the top of the scabbard it has a curved hilt as well um, so, this actually shows us that even though it's an Armenian weapon, it had a great lot of Seljuk Turkish influence. Still doesn't tell us why it got uh, in the northern Urals, right? But that's the beauty of it. We have some carved wooden lintel from the Monastery of, Holy, of the Holy Apostles in Moch, Armenia. Uh, this is preserved at the Museum of Armenian History of Yerevan. It dates to 1134. It shows uh, Saint Theodore holding his lance, Kushe, in the typical Western European manner. Right. However, the saint rides with a very bent leg in the step fashion, right? Uh, either say Turkic Persian fashion. This makes you really think because, you know, the Western European uh, couché lance grip, of course, it was compatible with somebody who would ride in that step way, but it was rather conceived for, like, major shock charges that required, like, your legs to be, well, you know, straight in, into uh, the, the stirrups with your, uh, your thigh muscles, like, waiting for, trying to resist this major impact, right? Whereas the bent leg in uh, horse riding is connected with the idea of crouching, especially to avoid some sort of um, arrow fire mostly. So um doesn't mean too much. Like here, this is just an artistic rendition. So doesn't have to be reality, but reality also is often displaying such uh, strange mixes as well. By the way, the other warrior saint, ri similarly riding with a bent knee, also seems to wear a small loose turban. Um, and his arms look much more Middle Eastern than the overall Byzantine influence art, art displayed here. Um, specifically a spear, straight sword, slung almost horizontally from his mouth. This was typical, again, of um, also 
yes, Arabotur kick Warper to some extent, he has a large round shield. The only difference between the two is that while the he, the Christian hero of the situation wears, um, say, it is striking the enemy with a straight non-tapering sword, as it's also more common in, you know, in the east um, compared to, to the west. Uh, the infidel figure holds a mace which connects him with again the the uh, stereotypical Islamic armament that was also a great deal influenced by uh, stamp warfare. Right, I will not digress on the importance of, of the mace also symbolically for, I don't know, uh, the Seljuks, um, the, the nomads of Central Asia, but it's here to, to observe for an Armenian art who was representing the, the enemy. Right. We have a carved relief from the monastery of Sith, uh, Sitha Kabor in Armenia dating to the early 14th century. It's now preserved at the Museum of Armenian History of Yerevan, and it depicts the Prince Amir Hassan II. Right. Um, the interesting aspect of this is that this is an Armenian guy, but he has a Turkic name. And he's also equipped like a Turk. Right. And this has to do with the gradual, again, absorption of Armenian to the Islamic sphere of influence, the cooptation of the Armenian aristocracy, the fact that they, they were adopting, in fact, this ruler's titles to be legitimized uh, at their eyes, etc. The prince also draws his recurved composite bow with a correct thumb draw. Um, that arrowhead is apparently very broad, perhaps even double-pointed uh, in type like a detail. We have a carved relief depicting um this is these are the catch um catch car stone crosses, right? Depicting literally a crosses like as uh reliefs carvings. And they uh, this this one is originally from Karabakh in eastern Armenia, it dates to the fourteenth century. And it's preserved at the Amyatsin Monastery in Amiats in Armenia. Um, this um, carving shows how 14th century crisis hit hard Armenia as it was being taken over by the um, by the forces of evil and and this happens in countries that are essentially devastated, collapsing, right? And so also their artistic capacity drops. Right. However, we can still get from it how heavy the Turco-Iranian uh, influence in the military style illustrated uh, really was. From the same source we see, for example, that the Middle Eastern flange or winged mace was also known in Armenia. I mean, obviously enough, right? But it's always interesting to see it uh, just documented explicitly, right? We know that different types of arms and armor were employed um, in uh, different countries and they did obviously correspond to a particular influence of a particular people. Uh, but let's say when you have it even just for, for these times and places represented once, you know, especially in this sort of more uh, distinctive ways, and in a way you can. Uh, again, that stands out, after all, uh, among relatively meager uh, documentation. That you know that that's gold, right? It it speaks volumes about the systemic um, dimension here. And again, Armenia by this time, especially was we're talking the Caucasian one was very open to those kind of influences, and it had been so for quite a while, telling the truth. We have a carved relief from Imirzak in the east of Armenia dating to 1233. This is the, the one of Grigor Kagbakian. Uh, uh, it's yet another Kachkar stone cross preserved at the same Emtsian monastery. And we see, in fact, Seljuk Turkish uh, influences 
even dominating at this point Armenian art. This was the peak of the, let's say, not of the unity of the um, of Seljuk uh, domains, but still one of important flourishing of expansion is the, the peak of the great medieval civilization uh, in general. So you see at this point in the Caucasus the uh, say the, the, the Turkic influence being very strong from also of course a Persian um, background, Persian influence background, but still with Armenia representing a sort of it's just like in antiquity, it was objectively more influenced by Persia than it was by uh, Hellenistic Western culture, right? This is particularly true for the old Armenian heartland in eastern Anatolia, um, looking from the west. We see Grigor Kakbakian wearing a version of the Sharbush fur lined hat that was typical of the uh, Turkic and Islamic military aristocracy. He wears a short chest and abdomen covering lamellar cuirass that is very common also in 13th century Islamic sources. We see a tassel under his horse's chin, which was originally the badge of pre Islamic Turkish aristocracy. We have the four Gospels from Armenia around the 70s of the 13th century from the Freer Gallery of Art manuscript number 3218 Washington DC um, this mm, manuscript is quite fascinating because it shows well like what was the degree of um, Byzantine archaism in Armenian art still um, at this time like and yet we find, even in this very much, in fact, Byzantine-looking uh, panoplies, some uh, more Eastern elements. For example, there is a small lamellar coiras that is actually very similar to the ones you find in 13th century Byzantine history, except for the lack of splinted arm and groin defenses, uh, which um, is um, a Seljuk influence, likely. Um, elsewhere we find Alberg's uh, face, male covering having tails, that's also quite typical of the time, conical helmets, some are clearly fluted, possibly we find Chapelle de Fer, and yes, uh, western influence arrived that far, aside from the development of similar models of helmet in this case, uh, locally, right, with plenty of western mercenaries around, so at that point the Mongols used them as far as the Indian Ocean, so it's, it's, it does make sense. Um, we find many lamellar neck defenses. There are also somehow typical, as we've seen in Byzantine warfare, even the East Eastern Balkan warfare. Um, this is a post-Mongol uh, reality, and we have a lot of that. Also just to parry the uh, increased uh, arrow power to, to an extent. But it's also just an evolution of panoply at this point was getting heavier for the, the elite pretty much everywhere. Uh, these areas, remember, are sinking into further feudalism and, and privatization. So you have also an increased, um, of course, centrality of the man at arm. We find uh, you know, something exceptional perhaps is recurved swords without any guard. We find a very similar weapon to the later Ottoman Yatagan. Uh, surely there is some connection with that. Uh, there is even a trident. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a strange. Uh, one may think that the Mongols brought this as a tribal emblem around uh, rather than a, than a weapon, but who knows what was uh, in the artist's mind in this case. Um, we have a carved relief from M uh, Amena Prkic. Um, this is yet another Kachkar stone cross. And it's um, still at the aforementioned Emmetsin Monastery near to Mount Ararat. 
this dates to 1271, and we find an interesting Mongol style here. Uh, the, in particular, the horse art, harness, saddle and crupper straps. Um, there is also a closed box like quiver that is of the typical Central Asian form, right? Except you find, for example, a couchet length that is very similar to the one that the Western Europeans used. Uh, this is interesting. And passing, in fact, to Western influences, um, let's stick to, to these now. Let's see from the West what was going on. We have the Gospel of Mukni, manuscript number 7736 at the Mathenadaran Library of Yerevan. This is from Armenia, dating to the mid 11th century. And it represents an axe, right, placed interestingly enough, in the hands of a shepherd at the nativity. And this is very similar to the Scandinavian bearded axe. We are in the mid-11th century. The Viking era is not even over, technically. We see lots of Normans around. Yes, th those wouldn't necessarily use uh, these weapons. They were mostly horsemen. But l let's not put limits to that um, optional armament they would bring with them. Uh, there wouldn't be anything strange, uh, even to have seen, I don't know, a Viking hired by the by an Armenian lord, right, uh, as a mercenary, just like the the Byzantines were doing, even if in in a more centralized fashion. But these are also just cultural influences. Of course, there were some types of Armenian bearded axes in their own ways. Just they're not so typical, and they look so much close to the Scandinavian ones in the broader surroundings that uh, we draw that connection. We have the Agbat Gospel from Ani, Eastern Armenia, dating to 1211. This is the manuscript number 6288 at the Matinadaran Library. We find yet another axe, uh, which is displayed in this il illustration uh, of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, and it may be a tool, not necessarily just a weapon. It has the blade attached to a long iron sleeve um, into which the wooden haft is inserted. And this weapon is a bit more mysterious, but it's very common uh, in 14th century Eastern Europe and Scandinavia. So there is surely a connection. Uh, it this see this prototype or something very similar to that inspired or influenced by a prototype in the 13th century. Uh, I made a video about Russian warfare explaining a bit better this type of weapons, but also in the Scandinavian one. Um, we find in, a, in the inner sanctuary grotto church of Gegard in Armenia, in the east of the country dating to the 3rd century, a rock cut carving which shows um, very long hafted axe. It's just like of, of a man's height, right? And it, this does look European as well. Perhaps the Crusaders brought that at this point, because it's fairly late in time, so um, we don't know. There may still have been a connection with Scandinavia or Eastern Europe, um, but there were these weapons in different contexts. Uh, there wasn't any of them in the Middle East. I will make, hopefully soon, a video about 13th century uh, Western European infantrymen. We will talk about these axes uh, in general. We have um, at the Matenadarian Library the manuscript 6201. Armenian, it's a gospel dating to 1038. Um, here it shows, uh, again, seen from from like you see, there's the centurion at the cru crucifixion, the guard at the tomb of Christ. Um, it's not such a great depiction. The art is very crude. Um, but it may be fateful regarding the this first half of 11th century Armenian military equipment. Find large round shields, long spears, um, that also have... Uh, uh, clearly indicated butt, uh, which means they could be, this weapon could be used as a as a pike of sort, fixating on 
terrain, like just countering some step cavalry's charge or something like that. Uh, the large round shield is surely an anti um, horse archer uh, characteristic in, in Armenian panoply at this point in history. It's very similar, perhaps, to something that was happening in uh, in Eastern Europe in the Balkans as a concept, of, if not as a design. Um, so these are still fascinating uh, indications. We find an Armenian gospel preserved at the Patriarchal Library of Amiatsen, dated to 1057. There is a scene of the betrayal, actually multiple ones, and we can see an assortment of weapons, swords, straight swords, uh, an axe. Um, it's important to stress that the, say that the local Armenian tradition had maintained an important degree of straight, straight blades. Uh, this was true for the Christian world in general. And it's just the Turks, the Mongols, that inject this larger amount of sabers, as we've seen. Uh, of course, the Armenians used, it, as we've seen before at this point, also curved blades, but the the straight ones were more typical, just like Constantinople, right? We find two types of mace and a per peculiar hafted weapon that we find also in Byzantine sources. It's not entirely clear in its, um, you know, raison d'être in function, but we appreciate the Byzantine connection. We have the manuscript number 979 at the Matenadaran Library. It's a lectionary and gospel dating to 1288. We find here different illustrations um, with face uh, figures with face covering male aventails quite often. It surely is a thing in Armenian panoply at this point. Um, it's also just at this point in history the result of Turco-Mongol influence, right? The rise in importance of horse archery. We find a two-piece helmet in common with contemporary Byzantine evidence. Um, we find even uh, the personified era, that is, anger in, in Latin, slaying um, herself with a European-style sword. So it's an interesting combination and consider that this is from the Caucasus so uh, do not underestimate after all even how Armenian tradition and Caucasus were connected still by an important degree and so how influences were far also west right remember I don't know the the Ilkhanate would use Genoese crossbowmen uh, for example right and other I don't know there were, there were other Latins uh, and more from the west um, we find uh, in the manuscript number 206 uh, at the Matenadaran Library, this is an, is an Eastern Armenian Gospel from 1318, a scene of the massacre of the innocents. Um, this place in particular, like um, the, the place where this Gospel was produced is in the south of Lake Sevan which is essentially in the central part, rather than eastern one of Armenia, essentially 60 kilometers northeast of Yerevan, right? It's 1900 meters above sea level, interestingly enough. And um, the peculiarity of this evidence is that the warriors depicted are completely Western European, <laughs> in armor at least. Um, so the idea is that either the artists came from Lesser Armenia, where, yes, I mean, there would be a heavier Western influence, but it's not that these guys were all Western, um, you know, equipped. Uh, or maybe the, the manuscript itself is not from Armenia, but maybe it was illustrated in Chilicha. Uh, in th there, there is maybe this, this option. Then there could be a specific choice that we do not understand depicting the soldiers in this way. Uh, we find them equipped with sleeved or sleeveless surcoats uh, over long-sleeved male hauberks. They have show, male shows, male coif, 
um, a couple of them wield uh, straight broadswords. Uh, a third figure, a single edged one instead. Right, and we have uh, distinctive land jets down their blades, which is actually a Middle Eastern thing with narrow keyons, um, which shows a bit also, of course, of more local influence. But it's remarkable how Western European these guys really look in armor. Then, um, speaking of something even more narrowly Western influence, we have the carved relief of the aforementioned King Leon the Second the Great. This is definitely uh, an interesting source from the Ilan Likale Castle in the Adana province, today's Turkey, so we are essentially within uh, the, the full representation of Chilean Armenian power. Um, it, this is the guy who has boosted Western feudalism in his own country, imitating Antioch, right? However, the guy poses iconographically as an Islamic ruler in this source. Uh, we find also other strange things. The fact that the sword, the straight sword in his hand is particularly big, right? definitely too much. Uh, there is also an old-fashioned nut-shaped pommel, right? Um, so it's possible that some Eastern European, I mean, uh, European influence had uh, brought even this sort of archaisms in. We do not know why. But the guy is represented Islamically so because of how, of course, he was playing. So we have definitely traced an interesting uh, picture. I have, again, not so much made Ar Armenia so far. Um, this video is, again, you have to take them as they come, meaning that they may seem messy and clumsy and whatever, but I think it's the closest to a, a broader introduction uh, can be done, and you have this interesting combination of sort of, like, what was these guys' warfare and why, and then doing something that I actually don't do often, that is properly looking at the iconography, and I'm actually satisfied with the fact that I can't use the full pictures because of copyright reasons. I have only these ones from Again, uh, Wiki, Wikimedia the, the comments, these are the only ones I can't credit safely um, for commercial purposes because I have ads on the channel. And um, yet, I would say that overall, if you bear with me and sort of, <laughs> you know, try to realize what, what what makes sense of what I say, I think you can read some interesting pattern in it from the region, from the, the military culture, and in a way that sort of opens your eyes a bit, that sort of helps you, because we do not know too much about these times and places in general. Um, the more distant we grow from, from the West, this is insane, like, uh, and the, the least we understand. Like, obviously, uh, this is not true in an absolute geographical sense, because, I don't know, China is much better documented, of course, than Central Asia. But the, the ways they're documented also in proportion to civilizational development are different, right? Some, some people... I've never been accused of being a Western centrist. I try not to... See, I, I'm, I will, I'm very vocal, actually, about my... It's not a bias, really. It's just if it is, it's because I uh, would just. N it's not because I'm a Westerner myself. Uh, only it's just. Again, this evidence is. It's being found out also just more by. Us Westerners, by historical interest and the, the same people sometimes that we, we discuss here. So, um, you can't unsee that, right? Uh, but it's important to stress that too, because we definitely see that the West is something else. It is different also from these other peoples. And yes, there is some Western superiority to a degree that you can't deny, even at this point. The, the sense is, ah, as far as the Middle Ages or antiquity, it's the West, it's, you know, as now there were other great civilizations. The West were just the, the primitives, the barbarians of the situation. That, 
it's not quite the case, right? And it is not, especially in a qualitative sense. Um, but I'm glad we are able to talk topics like these on this channel. I think that that's the funny part of it all. So I have made so far uh, with this video of six ones on Armenian warfare. I made Armenian infantry from the 6th to the 11th century. Then, well, okay, this is not technically about Armenia, but it's just from the Notitia de Nitatum encompassing Roman Armenia as well. But this one, Eurasian Steppes Warfare, Georgia, Armenia, Caucasian Albania from the 10th to the 13th century. Byzantine auxiliaries, this is also not about Armenians only, but you have them. This is just from the 4th to the 11th century. Serbs, Bulgarians, Georgians, Armenians, and Kurds. This one was more specific. Chilish and Armenian warfare between the 11th to the 13th century. Right, and we will uh, deal with it further because this is just the beginning. Like the, then there are all the battles, the, the troops types, the organization, the tactics. Um, so that that's all up to be done, right? But adding uh, these names, like uh, even just for the Google engine, the YouTube engine, I, I, I get very few views telling the truth. Not so unsatisfactory, but let's be honest, it, it's not that enormous much. Um, you know, the channel grows not too much, honestly, but you know, it still does. I still see people coming. You're very, very silent, right? <laughs> For being 16,000 people, either I am in too intimidating or you do not know what to say or why you subscribed. Or maybe you just, again, you're not... Maybe you just let me talk. You do not need to comment. I also never engage myself as a follower in... much in following in the first place, but... Uh, on YouTube, but... Uh, on other channels, but... I also don't intervene, I don't care, I like quiet life, let's say, and I can't find my information immediately somewhere else. Um, and so, let's see how this goes, really. It, it all depends on factors and times are very random. The other day a guy from, from Reddit shared uh, an old video that was also one of the blurred ones and it got over 600 views. And, uh, you know, if just it, that happened once a day, it would have a lot uh, of uh, easy growth, right? But, I mean, with 16,000 followers, we could do that, right? Just be active. When I say to share, to like, it's not just anecdotal. I know I say it only at the end of the video, uh, but I don't want to bother you during the video itself. So I think it's pretty obvious what you should be doing if you like the channel. All right, we're not faring too well, I tell you. I mean, we, it's okay in general, but it's I don't see many signs of dramatic increase, and uh, it's very all very slow. Right, and it could easily be much more than that. In any case, uh, let's see. Um, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.